From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Ladies and gentlemen, today is a very difficult day. I am, just like millions of people across Germany, horrified, shocked, and very sad about what happened last night in Berlin's Breitscheidplatz Square. Germany is in mourning after a truck plowed into a Christmas market, killing at least 12 people in Berlin, and what officials are describing as a deliberate attack. Meanwhile, in Turkey, the Russian ambassador to Ankara is assassinated by an off-duty Turkish police officer yelling, don't forget Aleppo, don't forget Syria. We'll speak to Phyllis Bennis of the Institute for Policy Studies. Then, as Donald Trump wins the Electoral College vote, we'll look at how he controls the media. You know my opinion to the media. It's very low. The press are liars. They're terrible people. And the media, look at all those people back there. Scavengers. They're like scavengers. They're scum. Absolute scum. Remember that. Scum. We'll speak with former Labor Secretary Robert Reich, professor at University of California, Berkeley. We've never before had a president or president-elect who has uh, has taken the media on so directly and so so negatively and, and tried to plant in the public's mind, and I think this is the real danger, Amy, trying to plant in the public's mind the notion uh, that the press uh, is uh, the enemy itself. We'll speak with the former Labor Secretary Robert Reich about Trump's control of the media, Trump's pick of Labor Secretary, and why he feels the country needs a peaceful resistance movement. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In Germany, 12 people were killed and 48 more wounded in Berlin after a truck drove into a Christmas market around 8 p.m. local time, plowing into the stalls packed with shoppers and tourists at about 40 miles an hour. Late Monday night, German media, citing local authorities, reported police detained one suspect in the case, a 23-year-old Pakistani refugee named Navid Baluch. He has denied all involvement in the attack, and early this morning, unnamed sources within the German police told local media they believe Navid was not involved in the attack and that the perpetrator may still be at large and armed. After the attack on Monday, as many as 250 police officers raided Berlin's largest refugee center, which is housed inside a hangar at a defunct airport, and questioned at least four people. No one was arrested. This is German Chancellor Angela Merkel speaking this morning. There is much we still do not know with sufficient certainty, but we must, as things stand now, assume it was a terrorist attack. I know it would be especially hard for us all to bear if it were confirmed that the person who committed this act was someone who sought protection and asylum in Germany. This would be especially despicable for the many, many Germans who day in, day out are actively working for refugees, as well as for those people who actually need our protection and who make an effort to integrate into our country. Germany has taken in far more refugees in the last two years than any other European Union country, as many as one million refugees in 2015. The attack recalled the Bastille Day attack on a boardwalk in Nice, France, in which 84 people were killed after a Tunisian-born French citizen drove a truck through crowds of people in July. The New York Post falsely reported ISIS militants had claimed responsibility for Monday's attack in Berlin. Following this report, the U.S.-based site Intelligence Group, which monitors the online activity of militant groups, said no one claimed responsibility for the attack so far. The Russian ambassador to Turkey, Andrei Karlov, was assassinated Monday evening at an art exhibition in Ankara, Turkey, in a shooting both Turkish and Russian leaders have called a terrorist attack. Turkish authorities say the lone gunman was a 22-year-old off-duty Turkish police officer. He shot Karlov dead in a dramatic scene in the middle of the art gallery as he yelled, don't forget Aleppo, don't forget Syria. The attack came as the Turkish foreign minister was on his way to Moscow, Russia, to meet with his Russian and Iranian counterparts for talks on the ongoing Syrian war. Russia has been backing the Syrian government in its war against anti-government rebels, most notably by launching a months-long bombing campaign against rebel-held East Eastern Aleppo, which included targeting hospitals and other medical centers. Russia's bombing campaign helped the Syrian government take over eastern Aleppo last week, marking a decisive battle in the five-year civil war. This is Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan following the assassination. I described this attack on Russia's embassy as an attack on Turkey. 
Turkey's state and nation. After the attack on the Russian ambassador during the talk with Mr. Putin, we agreed this is a provocation and there isn't any dispute. On Monday, Russian President Vladimir Putin also described the assassination as a provocation and said it sought to fray relations between Russia and Turkey. The committed crime is obviously a provocation designed to spoil normalization of Russian-Turkey relations and derailing the peace process in Syria, which is actively promoted by Russia, Turkey, Iran and other countries interested in reconcilement of the inter-Syria conflict. The assassination came only hours after the U.N. Security Council voted Monday to monitor evacuations from eastern Aleppo. The resolution passed unanimously. Russia had threatened to veto an earlier version of the plan. The Red Cross says 25,000 people have already been evacuated from eastern Aleppo since last week, when it fell to advancing Syrian government forces backed by Russian airstrikes. The Red Cross estimates estimates thousands of civilians remain to be evacuated. On Tuesday, Syrian soldiers reportedly broadcast messages over loudspeakers calling on anti-government rebels to leave eastern Aleppo. Last week, the U.N. accused Syrian government troops of shooting at at least 82 civilians on site amidst the fall of the city. In the United States, protests broke out across the country as the 538 electors of the Electoral College met in their respective state capitals and voted to elect Donald Trump, the 45th president of the United States. Trump scored 304 votes, well over the threshold of 270 votes necessary for him to become the next president. His Democratic challenger, Hillary Clinton, won 227 votes. This is Pennsylvania elector Tina Pickett. The basis of this is the people's vote. The people voted, and they placed their vote as they should and had a right to on November the 8th. And that is the basis of the vote that we place today, in my mind. I place that vote for the people of Pennsylvania. On November 8th, way. Trump won Pennsylvania by less than one percentage point. As the electors met inside, hundreds of protesters gathered outside state capitals across the country, including in Wisconsin, Michigan, Maine and Pennsylvania, where 12 immigrant rights activists were arrested during an anti-Trump rally, as they demanded the closure of the Burks Family Detention Center. In the lead-up to Monday's meeting of the Electoral College, millions of people had called on the electors to refuse used to vote for Donald Trump. There were 5 million signatures on one petition alone, but in the end, only two Republican electors, both from Texas, broke ranks and voted against Trump. In fact, more Democratic electors ended up voting against Hillary Clinton, instead casting three votes for former Secretary of State Colin Powell, one vote for Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, and one more vote for Yankton Sioux Nation leader Faith Spotted Eagle of South Dakota, who is part of the resistance to the Dakota access pipeline. The official election of Donald Trump comes as an interview aired in which First Lady Michelle Obama told Oprah Winfrey she and her husband, President Barack Obama, now know what it's like not to feel hope for the future. See, now we're feeling what not having hope feels like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> hope is necessary. It's, it's a necessary concept. <laughs> And Barack didn't just talk about hope because he thought it was just a nice slogan to get votes. I mean, he and I and so many believe that if you—what else do you have if you don't have hope? Yeah. What do you give your kids if you can't give them hope? Over the weekend, as clips of the taped interview were published online, Donald Trump attacked First Lady Michelle Obama, claiming she, quote, must have been talking about the past, unquote. On Monday, President Obama granted clemency to 231 prisoners, the most individual acts of clemency granted in a single day by any president in U.S. history. Obama pardoned 78 people and shortened the sentence of 153 others convicted of federal crimes. Obama has now pardoned a total of 148 people during his presidency and has shortened the sentences of 1,176 people, including 395 serving life sentences as part of a push to reduce the number of people serving long sentences for nonviolent drug offenses. But he still has not offered clemency or pardons to some high-profile political prisoners, including Army whistleblower Chelsea Manning or Native American activist Leonard Peltier. 
In North Carolina, the Charlotte City Council voted unanimously Monday to rescind the anti-LGBT ordinance that prompted North Carolina's House Bill 2, otherwise known as the bathroom bill. The law denies transgender people use of the bathroom, changing room or locker room that matches their gender identity. On Monday, North Carolina governor-elect Democrat Roy Cooper said lawmakers will meet for a special session today to repeal HB 2, which he's called, quote, one of the most discriminatory laws in the country. Chinese and U.S. officials say China has returned a U.S. Navy drone China seized in the South China Sea last week. The U.S. has called the seizure of the drone illegal. China's claimed territorial control over the South China Sea, one of the busiest trade routes in the world, while the U.S. has asserted the area should be considered international waters. After the drone was first seized, President-elect Donald Trump tweeted, China steals United States Navy research drone in international waters, rips it out of the water and takes it to China in unprecedented act, unquote. Trump later deleted the tweet after realizing he'd misspelled unprecedented. In Zurich, a gunman who wounded three people after opening fire during prayers at an Islamic center in Zurich has been found dead a short distance from the shooting. Swiss police say the gunman apparently committed suicide. The police have not identified the shooter. A worshiper who was a witness to the shooting says the three wounded victims were Somalis and that the Islamic center was frequently used as a mosque by Zurich's Somali community. The head of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, has been convicted in absentia by a French court of negligence by a person in position of public authority. The case stems from a case in which she approved the misuse of hundreds of millions of dollars of public funds in 2008 while she was French finance minister. The French court did not sentence Lagarde to any punishment, and she will not have to have a criminal record. United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki moon is calling on the UN Security Council to stop the flow of arms to South Sudan, warning of the possibility of genocide. The Security Council must take steps to stem the flow of arms to South Sudan, as well as send a clear warning that hate speech, incitement, and violence must end, and that there will be accountability for mass atrocities and other crimes. If we fail to act, South Sudan will be on a trajectory towards mass atrocities. As people will be the target of those atrocities while they pin their hopes on the international community in general and the Security Council. South Sudan is the world's youngest country. The United States backed South Sudan's independence in 2011, and the country's president, Salva Kiir, whose troops are now accused of carrying out the majority of the crimes in the ongoing civil war. And back in the United States in New Orleans, Mayor Mitch Landrieu has announced New Orleans has reached a $13.3 million settlement over three police brutality cases from the weeks before and after Hurricane Katrina. One of the cases involves the death of 40-year-old Ronald Madison, who was shot and killed on September 4, 2005, when a group of New Orleans police officers opened fire with AK-47s on families crossing the Danziger Bridge in search of food following Hurricane Katrina. Police later tried to cover up the case. Another case involved the death of 48-year-old Raymond Robert, who was beaten to death by a police officer one month before the hurricane. The families have been seeking justice in these cases for 11 years. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's show looking at a series of shocking attacks that shook Germany, Turkey and Switzerland Monday. In Germany, 12 people were killed and 48 more wounded in Berlin after a truck drove into a Christmas market around 8 p.m. local time, plowing into the stalls packed with shoppers and tourists at about 40 miles an hour. German police have detained a 23-year-old Pakistani asylum seeker as a possible suspect, but Berlin's police chief has acknowledged they may have picked up the wrong man. Meanwhile, in Turkey, the Russian ambassador to Turkey, Andrei Karlov, was assassinated Monday at an art exhibition in Ankara. Turkish authorities say the lone gunman was a 22-year-old off-duty Turkish police officer. He shot Karlov dead in a dramatic scene in the middle of the art gallery as the gunman yelled, don't forget Aleppo, don't forget Syria. Meanwhile, in Zurich, Switzerland, three people were injured when a gunman opened fire at a mosque frequented by Somali refugees. The gunman was later found dead, apparently, after committing suicide. 
To talk more about <clears throat> these attacks, we're joined by Phyllis Bennis, fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. She's written a number of books, including recently, Understanding ISIS and the New Global War on Terror. Phyllis, if you could respond to this latest series of attacks, each one different with its own circumstances. They are all different, Amy, and I think it's important that we consistently keep in mind that we don't have much information yet. There's most clear information about the assassination of the Russian ambassador in Turkey. There's very little information about the horrific uh, truck uh, scenario in Berlin. It's not even certain at this point that it was deliberate. It appears to have been. But we don't know who was responsible. As you said, the police chief of Berlin has said they don't think they have the right man in custody. Uh, so we don't have any idea who it was. It would not, however, I, th I think it would be a mistake to sort of say, well, it might be an accident, so we don't have to think about it in a political context. This is happening, of course, in the context of the continuation of the war in Syria, the reality that while the, uh, the horrific attacks on Aleppo have mostly come to an end at the moment, uh, and most people, most civilians have gotten out, there are some left who are hopefully going to be evacuated today. That war is far from over, and the consequences of that war have spread across its borders. That's part of the reason for the, the tensions and then reconciliation, new tensions, more reconciliation underway between Russia and Turkey, which may or may not have something to do with the assassination of the, uh, of the Russian uh, ambassador. And then, of course, the attack on the mosque in, in Zurich is a reminder that Islamophobia, attacks on, on refugees and immigrants are continuing and, indeed, are on the rise, certainly here in the United States, since the period of, of rising Islamophobia during the election campaign over this year, and particularly since the election of Donald Trump as president here in the United States. So the broad question uh, remains, we are facing a very, very difficult political reality, one that requires a great deal of new thinking about how to, uh, how to take on these questions. What we're looking at is a situation where I think the only thing we can be sure of is that refugees across Europe in particular, those in Turkey, those in Germany, are going to face a very serious consequences of this range of attacks that we've seen over the last 24 hours. On Monday, Phyllis, Donald Trump issued a statement after the Berlin attack. He said, quote, our hearts and prayers are with the loved ones of the victims of today's horrifying terror attack in Berlin. Innocent civilians were murdered in the streets as they prepared to celebrate the Christmas holiday. ISIS and other Islamist terrorists continually slaughter Christians in their communities and places of worship as part of their global jihad. These terrorists and their regional and worldwide networks must be eradicated from the face of the earth, a mission we will carry out with all freedom-loving partners. If you could talk about his focus on Christians, where, <clears throat> when you look at the last few days, um, well, in the Zurich attack, of course, Muslims, um, in Aden, in Yemen, uh, 48 people killed uh, on Sunday in a suicide bombing. The reality is that statement by Donald Trump is filled with false claims. Uh, one is, as you say, this notion that somehow Islamic Jihad or other uh, Islamic extremist organizations have particularly targeted Christians is simply not true. Far more Muslims uh, all around the world have died in these uh, horrific attacks than Christians have. The notion that the, the Christmas markets across Germany are somehow a, a religious expression is also simply not true. It's very much a cultural reality and uh, very much a culture of capitalism. These are, are small markets across uh, German cities, in the run-up to Christmas, they're very uh, secular. They're all about drinking hot mulled wine and buying little uh, uh, gifts, stocking stuffers sort of things. Uh, and they're very popular. They have very little to do with religion. So this part is simply not the case. The notion that Donald Trump is saying at a time when the German police are saying, we don't know who did this, we don't know for sure it was an act of terrorism at all, that he gets out in front of that and says, this was an act of terror, it was committed by radical Islamic terrorists, 
it's simply based on nothing. It's simply based on his assumptions, based presumably on his own uh, kind of uh, Islamophobia. So I think that we have to be very, very cautious in consistently challenging those false claims, whether they're made by Donald Trump or anybody else, uh, that simply make the situation worse and don't help us to either understand the motivations of people who might have carried these acts out, if indeed the one in Germany was a deliberate act, uh, and, most importantly, how to stop it, how to prevent it. That's what's important. Making false accusations without any basis in reality is simply going to make the situation worse and not better. <coughs> Phyllis, let's talk about what's happening in Syria right now and what you think needs to happen. What is the latest on the situation of thousands of people in eastern Aleppo and the attempted evacuations of them? I haven't heard the news for the last several hours. What we were hearing from yesterday is that the majority of civilians had made it out of Aleppo. Some are left. Uh, there's different assessments between the U.N., uh, the ICRC, other agencies on the ground about who might be left, how many people, how many may be civilians, how many may be uh, fighters. Some of the fighters have been refusing to leave. There had been an attack by uh, uh, rebel forces against a, a, lore, a set of buses that were en route to take civilians out of two uh, towns adjoining Aleppo that had been besieged for months by rebel forces. Uh, and the government had wanted those civilians allowed out. That was the kind of quid pro quo that was underway in the evacuations of the last few days. Uh, that evacuation seems to be underway again, but I don't think it's complete yet. So the question of Aleppo is not a settled question. It's on the verge of being definitively taken by the government which would be a, a very significant uh, victory for the government forces, made possible a lot by the role of Russia, particularly Russian airstrikes, many of which attacked civilian targets, medical uh, facilities and others. Uh, so the, the, the cost to civilians in East Aleppo has been enormous. The cost in, to civilians in, in western Aleppo and other parts of Syria uh, continue as well. And, of course, right now we're also hearing about the, the massive civilian destruction that's underway in uh, Mosul, in Iraq, where the U.S. is carrying out airstrikes, uh, again, in an effort, supposedly, to rid the, the city of its control by ISIS, but at the enormous human and civilian cost to the city and to the people who live there. So the militarization of the global war on terror, both in Syria and in Iraq, is taking a huge toll on civilians. Uh, the, and it's certainly, as we're seeing now, uh, potentially—we, again, don't know this—but the, the notion that ending the control by ISIS of the territory and populations that they have had under their control in both Syria and Iraq, imagining that somehow that's going to end the problem of ISIS as a terrorist force is simply not the case. We've known for a long time terrorism experts, even U.S. government officials, although they haven't operated off of this, but have acknowledged that the likelihood is that as ISIS loses control of territory, it will return to its origins as a more, if you will, old-fashioned terrorist organization, carrying out attacks on civilians in the region, probably most of all, somewhat further afield, perhaps in Europe, perhaps elsewhere. But what we're seeing right now is the reality that this global war on terror is indeed having global ramifications, and the militarization is increasing the threat to civilians around Europe and elsewhere, but most particularly in the Middle East region. Phyllis Bennis, I want to thank you for being with us, fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. Thanks so much for joining us. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, former Labor Secretary Robert Reich on Donald Trump. Stay with us.
This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In the United States, protests broke out around the country Monday as the 538 electors of the Electoral College met in their respective state capitals and decisively voted to make Donald Trump the 45th president of the United States. Trump received 304 votes, well over the threshold of 270, necessary for him to become the next president. His Democratic challenger, Hillary Clinton, won 227 votes. Trump is scheduled to be sworn in as president one month from today, on January 20th. We spend the rest of the hour with Robert Reich, who served as labor secretary under President Bill Clinton. Reich, who now teaches at University of California, Berkeley, has emerged as one of Donald Trump's most vocal critics. He recently wrote a piece headlined, Trump's Seven Techniques to Control the Media. I interviewed him yesterday and began by asking him what he thinks Donald Trump represents. Donald Trump, uh, besides, in my view, not being qualified to be president and uh actually on the campaign trail and even after the campaign was over, uh, advocating, legitimizing and enabling people to be quite hateful in America, if they were already leaning in that direction. Uh, Donald Trump also uh, does not have any understanding of a democracy. And if anything, his leanings are toward tyranny. And by tyranny, I simply mean someone who uh, ab absorbs the trappings of power. Uh, but doesn't understand that he, in a democracy, is a public servant. He is working for us. Uh, we are not working for him. And in many ways, Donald Trump seems to be indifferent, at best, uh, to the democratic process. Uh, he, for example, treats the press, the, uh, and we need a free and independent press. The, uh, every democracy requires a free and independent press to report on what the powerful are doing. Uh, Trump continues to denigrate the press and to bypass it whenever he has any opportunity. So Let's specifically get into this issue of the press. Um, you wrote a fascinating piece um, saying, as you've said now, democracy depends on an independent press, which is why all tyrants try to squelch it. They use seven techniques that, worryingly, President-elect Trump uh, already employs. Go in detail into these seven techniques, beginning with berating the media? Uh, Donald Trump has, uh, almost from the beginning of his campaign, and certainly in the—and he's continued it uh, in the post-election period, uh, to denigrate and berate the, the media. He holds rallies, and he talks about uh, the dishonest media. He uses adjectives like, uh, like scum uh, and scoundrel uh, to uh, describe uh, the media. Uh, he picks out individual members of the press who have criticized him uh, and uh, talks about them in very critical terms or mocks them. Uh, this is not— the habit of a, a democratic, democratically elected president. Uh, we've had presidents who have been upset by particular reports. Harry Truman, for example, was very upset when his uh, when when the media reported a particular reported a reporter uh, criticized his his daughter's singing, uh, and uh, and he had some uh, quite uh, stern words about that reporter. But we've never before had a president or a president elect who has uh, has taken the media on so directly and so so negatively. And, and tried to plant in the public's mind. And I think this is the real danger, Amy, trying to plant in the public's mind the notion uh, that the press uh, is the enemy itself. Uh, if, if the public uh, doesn't believe in a, f a free and independent press, uh, then uh, we're in a kind of fact-free universe, because uh, uh, and, and, and also a president is, is, is immune from criticism. And I think that's, uh, consciously or not, what Donald Trump is seeking. Your number two point of techniques that Trump has used to control the media blacklist critical media. During the campaign, he blacklisted news outlets like pulling The Washington Post's credentials. Um, I was surprised at the time that other reporters on the campaign trail covering Trump didn't jointly say, if they are not allowed in, we will not report on you, we will not go in either. 
Uh, I was surprised as well. Um, and what the media certainly needs to do is stand up for itself and stand up for other members of the media. Now, I understand media—you uh, know, the, the, the situation today is very competitive, uh, and there are a lot of media outlets that are worried about losing readership and so forth. Uh, but it is very important for the media to stand for a free and independent media. Uh, he's announced, for example, that his White House press room, when and if he ever has a news conference, uh, will be uh, no longer be assigned. Media will no longer be assigned uh, seats. Uh, they will be uh, they will actually be assigned. Those seats will be assigned by the White House press room, not by the media um, who cover uh, the White House. Uh, this may you're seem saying like a by small Trump's detail. People. No, it's not a small detail at all. But you're saying by Trump's detail and not yes. the White House Press Association. Exactly. It's instead of the White House Press Association, Trump's own office, his own detail, will be uh, assigning those seats. And there, again, uh, is a dangerous precedent in terms of undermining the freedom and the independence of the press. Uh, uh, Donald Trump looks at the press the same way he looks at everything else, the art of the deal. Uh, if he can uh, strike a deal that will uh, give the press uh, something or a particular member of the press or a particular newspaper or news outlet uh, an advantage, uh, then he expects expect something in return, in terms of favorable coverage. Um, but uh, that's not the way it's supposed to work in the United States or in any democracy. That's why we have uh, a, a strict demarcation between the press uh, and those in power. Number three in your list of seven techniques to control <clears throat> the media, turning the public against the media. I want to go to a clip of Donald Trump. You know my opinion of the media. It's very low. The press are liars. They're terrible people. And the media, look at all those people back there. Scavengers, they're like scavengers. Show them the crowd, press. Show them the crowd. Show them the crowd. Look, they're not turning the cameras. They don't even turn the cameras. They don't even turn the cameras, because you know what? They're very dishonest people. Disgusting reporters, horrible people. Sure. Some are nice. They're scum, absolute scum. Remember that, scum. So you have Trump referring to the media as lying, dishonest, disgusting scum. And then you point out, for example, questioning the press motives, like talking about The Washington Post's publisher, Jeff Bezos, uh, head of Amazon. Talk about that. Uh, when uh, again, this is unprecedented. Uh, we have a, a president elect of the United States who um, uh, comes up with ulterior motives for why a major news outlet like The Washington Post uh, might be critical of him. He says uh, Jeff Bezos, who is the uh, the publisher of The Washington Post, also uh, from Amazon. Uh, uh, is, is somehow uh, worried about an antitrust action and, therefore, doesn't want Trump to be president or, or didn't want Trump to be president, is worried about Trump. Uh, but this, this finding of, of ulterior motives, uh, of assigning uh, particular uh, uh, strange and, 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 and irrelevant reasons why a, a, an outpost of the press might actually be criticizing Donald Trump uh, is an effort, it seems to me, to undermine the credibility uh, of the press, to, to cause the public uh, to doubt what they are reading. Um, and Donald Trump, remember, lives in a fact-free universe. Uh, this is somebody who, uh, even after the election, has said that, uh, for example, he won by a landslide, when we know that he won—he didn't win by a landslide. In fact, Hillary Clinton uh, came out with almost three million more votes, popular votes, than Donald Trump. He says uh, there was massive voter fraud. Uh, we know there, w there was no evidence of massive voter fraud. Uh, he says that uh, the homicide rate is up 45 uh, percent. We know that the homicide rate is actually down 50 percent. But if, in a fact-free universe, unless the free press, unless we have a, a media that is capable of, of correcting the record, uh, then uh, we have a president who can say almost anything to justify whatever he wants to do. Uh, that, again, is a very, very dangerous situation in a democracy. Uh, as you point out, you said um, that uh, Jeffrey Bezos, the publisher of The Washington Post, the founder of Amazon, uh, Donald Trump said The Washington Post wrote negative things about him because Bezos, quote, thinks I would go after him for antitrust. 
Um, and when, when Donald Trump goes after uh, Jeffrey Bezos, the, pub, the publisher of The Washington Post, um, because uh, of, of, of some 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 notion that that Amazon and Bezos uh, are worried about a possible antitrust action that Trump might inspire uh, that is designed to undermine the the credibility in the public's mind of anything that the Washington Post might publish it, it is a uh, an absurd allegation uh, th there's no reason to believe that the post's reporting uh, turns upon Jeff Bezos's concern about Amazon and and any antitrust issues. But you see, uh, by creating this kind of conspiracy uh, theory or this, this, this kind of paranoid notion about the press and, and planting it in the public's mind, uh, the, the public, or at least a portion of the public, uh, is led to, uh, to think that anything that The Washington Post uh, or uh, another paper whose credibility uh, the president-elect tries to undermine uh, says is, is justified or is true. Uh, and again, that is terribly dangerous in a democracy. Or he might be threatening the reverse. Uh, by saying that, he's saying, I <clears throat> could go after him on uh, issues of antitrust. Absolutely. He's signaling to the press that he also has the power. Uh, whether it's antitrust uh, or it is uh, it, it is the IRS or the FBI or whatever whatever he is going to be uh, directly or indirectly in command of, uh, he is also signaling to the press uh, that he has that kind of power. I wanted to read to you something from Politico. It says Donald Trump's campaign struck a deal with Sinclair Broadcast Group during the campaign to try and secure better media coverage. His son-in-law Jared Kushner told business executives Friday in Manhattan. Kushner said the agreement with Sinclair, which owns television stations across the country in many swing states and often packaging news for their affiliates to run, gave them more access to Trump and the campaign, according to six people who heard his remarks. In exchange, Sinclair would broadcast their Trump interviews across the country without commentary, Kushner said. Your concerns about this, Robert Reich? <clears throat> well, every president in every press room in, in every White House does uh, make tacit, have tacit understandings with the press. You know, you get this interview uh, with the president uh, if, uh, and it will be an exclusive interview, uh, but, uh, and, and we're not going to allow anybody else to have that interview, but you've got to, you've got to give him uh, that time to say his piece. Uh, that's not unusual. What's very unusual, though, is when a White House strikes a deal with a news outlet not to comment on what the president might be saying in a rally or, or any other event. That basically is a gag order. I mean, that is a an agreement by the press not to have an opinion, uh, not to express itself, not to point out to the public anything, uh, not to uh, even provide any facts to the public that might be important in terms of understanding the context of a presidential event or what a president says. Uh, that, again, is terribly dangerous in a democracy. It, it, it actually creates and it undermines the independence and the freedom of the press. In number four of Trump's seven techniques to control the media, you talk about condemning satirical or critical comments. I wanted to go to a clip of Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Kellyanne, I just retweeted the best tweet. I mean, wow, what a great, smart tweet. <laughs> Mr. Trump, we're in a security briefing. I know, but this could not wait. It was from a young man named Seth. He's 16, he's in high school, and I really did retweet him. Seriously, this is real. He really did do this. Well, sir, you're the president-elect, so I guess you can do whatever you want, but we'd really like to fill you in on Syria. God, Seth seems so cool. <laughs> His Twitter bio says he wants to make America great again. That is cool, sir. It also says he loves the Anaheim Ducks. Okay, see, there is a reason, actually, that Donald tweets so much. He does it to distract the media from his business conflicts and all the very scary people in his cabinet. <laughs> oh, that does make sense. Very clever, sir. Actually, that's not why I do it. I do it because my brain is bad. 
That, of course, Alec Baldwin playing Donald Trump, as he continues to do now after the election, as he did before. Um, there are many who felt, if this had started earlier on, uh, that Trump never would have made it to this point, or perhaps if John Stewart was still doing The Daily Show or Stephen Colbert still on Comedy Central. But this issue of satire um, and Donald Trump tweeting after that what after the scene we just played trump tweeting it was a totally one-sided bias show nothing funny at all equal time for us how serious this is robert reich uh, well it, it I, on on one level it simply reveals a, a very thin-skinned and vindictive person uh, and on the part of uh, Donald Trump, who doesn't have any sense of humor. Uh, but uh, on a deeper level, there are some real dangers here, because a president, an administration, uh, particularly when the administration and its and Congress are of the same party, uh, does have some power uh, in terms of the Federal Communications Commission and other agencies uh, that could make it difficult for a particular broadcaster uh, to function. Uh, and by saying uh, equal time for our side, uh, that's a kind of ironic comment, because the equal time rule uh, by the FCC is gone. Uh, Donald Trump really dominated all of the uh, news coverage during the campaign, was given free time by the media. Uh, satire also is probably one of the most effective means of criticizing any uh, any any person in power, whether that person is 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 elected or uh, is a uh, is just a, a takes power, uh, traditionally uh, through time, satire has been incredibly useful and important uh, to criticize uh, people who are using satire, again uh, in a, in a very very fundamental way. Uh, uh, turns the public, potentially turns the public, against uh, these individuals. Uh, uh, Donald Trump has, has tweeted against Alec Baldwin specifically and personally. Uh, and those personal tweets uh, could uh, potentially uh, have some damage. I, I do know that people who have criticized Donald Trump in various ways and then Donald Trump has tweeted against them uh, have in turn received threat uh, threats, including death threats, uh, from some of Trump's followers. Uh, we don't want to have in this country that kind of chilling effect uh, on free speech or on satire or any form of free speech. Speech. We'll be back with UC Berkeley professor Robert Reich, former labor secretary under President Clinton, in a minute. Natural Blue by Julie Byrne. Here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, we are speaking to former Labor Secretary Robert Reich, who recently wrote a piece headlined, Trump's Seven Techniques to Control the Media. I asked him about Donald Trump's response to what happened when Vice President-elect Mike Pence attended the Broadway hit Hamilton shortly after the election. At the end of the show, actor Brandon Victor Dixon, who plays Aaron Burr, read a message for Pence from the stage. Vice President-elect Pence, we welcome you and we truly thank you for joining us here at Hamilton and American Musical. We really do. We, sir, we are the diverse America who are alarmed and anxious that your new administration will not protect us. Our planet, our children, our parents, or defend us and uphold our inalienable rights, sir. But we truly hope that this show has inspired you to uphold our American values and to work on behalf of all of us. All of us. Donald Trump responded to the Hamilton message by tweeting, the cast of Hamilton was very rude last night to a very good man, Mike Pence. Apologize. I asked former Labor Secretary Robert Reich to respond. There was nothing about that note, as I read about it and read the content of that note, that was harassing. Uh, in fact, it was very dignified, uh, very modest. Uh, it simply expressed the cast's hope uh, 
uh, because uh, the cast of that Broadway show is uh, very diverse, uh, multiracial, uh, multiethnic. Uh, their hope that the Trump administration would be sensitive to their uh, concerns about not being hateful and not promoting uh, racism. Uh, and for Donald Trump to jump on that cast uh, and to say that they owe Michael Pence an apology uh, and that this was in some way inappropriate also has a potential to chill freedom of speech. Uh, if, if, if any other set of performers want to say something that is slightly critical or at least uh, signal their discontent in some way with the Trump administration, are they going to be faced with a deluge of, of similar tweets or similar criticisms? Uh, and what is the consequence of those tweets and criticisms, not only in terms of audiences in the future? I don't think there's any problem of Hamilton getting a very, very large audience. Uh, but what about people? Uh, uh, playwrights and, and casts and, and producers uh, that are uh, struggling to, to attract audiences or, or are worried about uh, even about threats that may come back to them uh, because of Donald Trump's uh, outrage. Uh, you, you see how delicate this all is, Amy. They, uh, our freedom of the press uh, depends on a lot of tacit norms and understandings between people in power, uh, the president, uh, a president-elect, uh, and uh, the, the, the public at large, uh, and the press itself. Uh, the press is called the fourth estate. Uh, it's called the fourth estate because uh, it, it has almost governmental functions uh, in terms of uh, being outside the government, but be being able to criticize what is happening in the government so the public is aware of, of potential problems. Without that freedom of the press, as the framers of the Constitution understood, uh, we cannot have a fully functioning democracy. Your number five in Trump's seven techniques to control the media is threatening the media directly threatening to sue, for example, um, what The New York Times wrote about him when it came to his tax returns uh, and when it came, as well, to accusations that women made of him directly assaulting them. Um, uh, Donald Trump's mentor uh, for many years, uh, when he was a younger man, was a fellow named Roy, Roy Cohn. Uh, a lawyer in uh, New York who was also an assistant, had been assi an assistant uh, to Senator Joe McCarthy during the uh, 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 McCarthy's witch hunts, uh, communist witch hunts in the 1950s. Uh, what Roy Cohn did o always, over and over again, was, uh, was, was sue people, uh, issued lawsuits, uh, libelous lawsuits often, when there was anything in the paper uh, that was critical of Roy Cohn or his clients. Uh, Donald Trump apparently internalized this and has a history of, of mounting lawsuits. What, but when you are uh, a president-elect or when you're a candidate, and certainly when you're a president, uh, you cannot go around uh, trying to intimidate uh, the press and, 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 and issuing lawsuits or, or threatening lawsuits because they say something that you don't like they, uh, about them. And this is what Trump did during the campaign. He also has threatened to uh, expand the libel laws, uh, making it easier, he says, uh, for somebody like him uh, to sue uh, the, the media. Uh, and you, again, presumably, that lawsuit would be based upon uh, something that the media reported that he did not like to be reported, didn't want to be reported. Uh, again, a very, very dangerous threat. Number six is limiting media access. Uh, you point out Trump hasn't had a news conference since uh, July, when he famously called on Russia to hack Hillary Clinton's email. Let's take a listen. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. I think you will probably be rewarded mightily by our press. So that's Donald Trump at his last news conference, and he hasn't held one since. He's also said that, um, as uh, president, he won't necessarily be having daily press briefings, you know, his press secretary. But you talk out about, about how he's blocked the media from traveling with him. You talk about his first conversation with Putin, where it actually first um, was reported. It wasn't in the United States. Yes, it's, inter it's interesting and indicative that that first conversation with Putin, which took place right after he was elected, uh, was reported by the Kremlin. 
uh, first, uh, not by any United States media. Uh, Donald Trump doesn't like the media. He doesn't want to be confronted by the media. Uh, he doesn't want to have news conferences. Three days after he was elected, uh, Barack Obama had his first news conference. Uh, three days after he was elected uh, and, uh, and the Supreme Court decided that election, uh, George W. Bush had his first news conference. Uh, Donald Trump has not had a news conference since July. He hasn't had any news conference since uh, he was elected. Uh, you see, what he wants to avoid here uh, is uh, being ganged up on. Uh, he, he, he's de desperately afraid uh, that there might be a, a variety of questions coming from various news organizations uh, about the same set of issues, uh, and uh, that would make him look and feel uh, less powerful. And so, like many uh, and I, and I use this word advisedly, many uh, dictators or tyrants in history uh, who don't want uh, to have news conferences, they don't want to be bombarded with questions from the press. Uh, Donald Trump uh, is, uh, is, is avoiding uh, the possibility that he will have many different news outlets asking him and pummeling him with questions. He doesn't want uh, that possibility. And finally, um, you talk about bypassing the media and communicating with the public directly, as he does with tweets, as he does with his rallies, which he seems to uh, be continuing. In fact, just this past weekend, another victory rally. I wanted to play a clip. Michelle Obama said yesterday that there's no hope. But I assume she was talking about the past, not the future, because I'm telling you, we have tremendous hope. That was Donald Trump this weekend at a yet another victory rally, which he used to attack Michelle Obama, the first lady, Robert Reich. Uh, Donald Trump's modus operandi seems to be to uh, communicate directly with, with followers and with the public through tweets and through rallies, and he signaled that he wants to continue uh, to use rallies uh, even after uh, January 20th, when he becomes president. Uh, the, the, the problem for the free press is that the more you have a president uh, who is communicating directly through tweets and rallies, uh, the less able uh, are the press uh, or as the media, uh, to be able to uh, intermediate. I mean, the, the, the word media comes from uh, the term intermediation, uh, which is speaking truth to power. It's, it's, it's actually intermediating between the powerful and the public, uh, so that uh, the powerful can be held accountable, so that they can be asked questions on, on behalf of the public, so that uh, there can be criticism uh, voiced, uh, where individual members of the public don't have the power to do that. They are just sort of a, 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 a very, very large uh, group of, of individuals who, none of whom has the power to talk back. Uh, that's why the intermediaries, the media, uh, are so important. But if you have a president who is communicating absolutely directly with the public, uh, bypassing all of those intermediaries, uh, then you have uh, potentially a situation in which uh, what he, that president says cannot be questioned. Um, the truth cannot get out. And um, the, the fear is that that's ultimately what Donald Trump wants, uh, to be able to continue uh, to, say, to state uh, things that are simply not true. Um, you know, that uh, doubting uh, climate change, for example, or, or saying that the CIA report on Russian hacking was not true, and, and have a larger and larger number of his followers uh, and, indirectly, uh, their friends and their associates and families uh, believe him and not believe science and not believe the media, not believe policy analysts and not believe uh, people who are investigative reporters and, and not believe the actual facts out there 
there, believe this counter universe uh, that is of Donald Trump's uh, creation. Hmm. We're talking to Robert Reich, former labor secretary under President Clinton, now professor at University of California, Berkeley. So let's go to the labor secretary nominee uh, of Donald Trump, the president-elect, Andrew Puzder, the fast food CEO, um, who is the head of the company that franchises Hardee's and Carl's Jr., longtime Republican donor. Uh, vocal critic, not just of the living wage, but of the minimum wage, expansion of overtime pay, paid sick leave, and the Affordable Care Act. Can you talk about the significance of this position that you occupied decades ago? Uh, the, the Secretary of Labor uh, presides over a vast regulatory and enforcement uh, agency in charge of all of the labor laws of the United States. Uh, beginning with uh, everything from unemployment insurance all the way through workplace safety and pension protection uh, and enforcing the minimum wage laws uh, and the uh, 40 hour work week with time and a half for overtime and, and everything you can imagine. Uh, if you have a secretary of labor who is anti these labor laws. Uh, and Andrew Puzner has said again and again uh, that he's against raising the minimum wage. He doesn't even believe in a federal minimum wage. He's, a, he's against uh, the overtime regulations that came out by uh, that President Obama uh, promulgated. Uh, he's against many of these labor laws. Uh, if you have a president, a, a, a secretary of labor who is against all of these labor laws, uh, there's a, a substantial danger uh, that they will not be enforced, because that's what the Labor Department does, is it enforces. Uh, and uh, I frankly worry about that. I, I've seen up close how important that enforcement is. Uh, you have some firms uh, that will disregard those laws unless the, uh, the risk of getting caught times the penalty uh, is greater than the benefits to that firm of, of simply flouting those laws. Mine safety is a, is a good example. We've had, tragically in the past, examples of, uh, of, of mine owners who have basically turned their backs on those, uh, those laws. A, a mine owner like, incidentally, or perhaps not incidentally, Wilbur Ross, uh, who is going to be Secretary of Commerce. Uh, that terrible mine tragedy at one of his mines, uh, where he was—he actually owned. Uh, well, if you have a secretary of labor that is not enforcing the mine safety laws, uh, you're going to have mine owners that basically disregard them, uh, like Wilbur Ross did. Um, Robert again, Reich, ag we just have a minute and a half to go, and I want to get to your piece on the first 100-day resistance agenda. A lot of people are analyzing what's going right on right now. Not a lot are doing what you did and actually talking about a resistance agenda that talks about getting Democrats in Congress and across the country to pledge to oppose the Trump agenda, to boycotting all Trump products, real estate, hotels, resorts, everything um, around the world. Can you go through what you're suggesting? Uh, yes. Uh, Amy, generally, I, I think we do have to regard this as not a normal presidency. Uh, it, you know, some people say, oh, well, it's just a—we've uh, had conservative, pompous, uh, narcissistic presidents before. Uh, this, is, this is not normal. Uh, this is really dangerous. Uh, and we have to resist. We have to have a peaceful resistance. Uh, and what I try to do is list the kind of things that we all, as citizens, uh, need to do and need to have our representatives and senators in Congress do, uh, and not only uh, mount a forceful rejection of these Trump nominees, most of whom are uh, completely unqualified and incompetent with regard to enforcing uh, the purposes of these agencies that they are going to be running, or Trump wants them to run, uh, but also uh, individually. We need to boycott Trump products. That's Robert Reich, former Clinton labor secretary, now professor of public policy at UC Berkeley. We'll link to his recent pieces, the first 100-day resistance agenda and Trump's seven techniques to control the media. We'll link to it at democracynow.org. It's now been 146 days since Donald Trump has held a news conference. That does it for today's show. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Nermeen Sheikh, Carla Wills, Laura Godestiner, Dina Guster, Sam Alkoff, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, Trina Dura, and Andre Lewis. 
special welcome back to Julie Crosby. And thanks to Miguel Nagero, Mike DeFilippo, and Paul Huckabee, as well as Julie Crosby, Hugh Grant. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.